Okay, hello everyone. I'm speaking today from the uh, City of Light and uh, I'm speaking all the way uh, uh, to a guest in Bulawayo, uh, David Coltart. Uh, welcome. Thanks, you Hugo. It's uh, good to be with you this evening. Oh, thank you, David. Um, David, so the topic today is Zimbabwe in general and, um, you know, it's a rather open discussion between you and me because um, I think Zimbabwe is, is one of those countries that's really overlooked in the world. Um, it's got so many lessons for so many countries, and, and among others, you know, my home, South Africa. Um, and I guess I want to start with Rhodesia, you know, and, and maybe we can go through the Ian Smith era just briefly and, and where you were as a, growing up in Zimbabwe. You know, how did that unfold and how did you experience it? So, <clears throat> as you've said, Rhodesia and, and following that Zimbabwe is very much a tragic story because um, if ever there was a country in Africa which is a story of lost opportunities and a failure to, to reach its true potential, it's this country. Um, going right back deep into history, in 1923, uh, Smuts, Jan Smuts, General Jan Smuts, tried to persuade Rhodesians to uh, vote in favor of joining the Union of South Africa. It was viewed as importantly as that. It, was, it would then have become a fifth province of the Union of South Africa. And even in, as late as the 1950s, um, the British government viewed this country uh, as being very close to a dominion. In, in other words, it equated it to South Africa, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And even in sporting terms, one of the jokes I have is that this is one of the few countries that can boast that it's never lost to, to, to the All Blacks at rugby, um, <laughs> you know, as, as, as a nation. But yeah. in all seriousness, uh, the reason for that is because it is a country of enormous potential. Uh, I was born uh, in southern Rhodesia, uh, 1957, and I've spent my entire life here. Uh, went to school uh, at a local school in Bulawayo, um, as happened to um, all young white males. I uh, was conscripted. I had to go and fight for Smith, and fought in this uh, dreadful uh, African version of of Vietnam for some two and a half years. Uh, then went to university to study law at Cape Town. And I came back to the new Zimbabwe in late 1982 uh, with great aspirations because I felt that, um, that Mugabe at the time was saying the right things and that Zimbabwe might become a paragon of virtue, uh, you know, a democratic country. But, of course, uh, that, that hasn't happened. Uh, but that's a, a thumbnail. In the 1980s, um, it, it interrupt you there, but uh, we tend to forget Robert Mugabe was the first African leader that preached reconciliation between blacks and whites. I know Julius Nyerere preached something comparable, but Mugabe was really the one who openly stated it. And in the 1980s, um, you know, I was born 1990, so it's obviously before my time. Uh, my understanding has been that uh, many whites uh, viewed Mugabe in quite a favorable light. You know, of course, during the Bush War, it was factionism, it was the Cold War, it was the Vietnam, the comparable Vietnam War. But afterwards, it would seem that at least in the initial periods, people were willing to forgive and maybe not forget, but to move on and to try and build the United Country. And I, I know you, reading from your background, you were at the University of Cape Town, you were involved in student movements there to try and encourage people to, uh, to get involved with Zimbabwe. And, um, you know, maybe describe that, that aspiration period, you know, the 80s. What was it like and, and you know, the, the euphoria, I suppose, that comes of independence? Well, in many ways, uh, Mugabe in the early days was viewed a bit like uh, Mandela. He, he had been the, um, the chief protagonist against whites. He'd led this armed struggle. But at independence, he um, appeared to want to reconcile with, with whites and put the war behind him. And, and in many respects, uh, he did that towards the white community. Uh, a lot of white farmers uh, started farming again, particularly in the north of the country, the most uh, prolific farming areas of the country. And um, whites were, 
were favorably disposed towards him. When I was at UCT in 1981, uh, as a student leader, I, I was uh, chair of the Zimbabwe Students Society, which represented the interests of about a thousand Zimbabwean students at UCT at the time. And I got a personal telegram from Robert Mugabe um, saying that uh, we were all welcome back and he painted this vision of a democratic multiracial society. And so when I came back in 1982, I was very favorably disposed towards Mugabe. What I didn't appreciate at the time was that Mugabe had uh, in quite a cynical way, decided to neutralize the whites by, by drawing them in, by saying the right things, because um, the chief threat to his goal of achieving a one-party state uh, wasn't the white community, which was tiny, um, but was rather uh, Joshua Nkomo and yeah. uh, his Zapu party, which had won about 20% of the vote in 1980. And, and Mugabe shifted his attention uh, in those early years to, to trying to crush uh, uh, Joshua and Cuomo and the Zapu party. But because of that, whites were, uh, were excluded from that hostility. And, and a lot of whites, including myself, as I say, were uh, very favorably disposed towards Mugabe in the early years. So, so was it, um, I mean, the, 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 the Shona and the Bailey uh, rivalry obviously goes back to the days of Sousa Rhodes, if not before that, the days of Shaka even. Um, you know, and, and it, it's sad that the country first went into tribalism, you know, and, and then later on in, into racism. But do you think there was any sign of sincerity about Mugabe, about Mugabe at the time, or was it just pure um, politics and, and trying to say the right thing? At the time, we thought he was sincere, um, but history has now shown that um, as early as April 1980, literally the month that uh, Zimbabwe got its independence from Britain. Uh, Mugabe was plotting to bring about a one-party state. He met um, Kim Il-sung on the sidelines of Tito's funeral in, in Eastern Europe and started plotting the creation of a military brigade which was designed to crush the political opposition. Um, at the time, we did not know that, but these revelations have subsequently been made known and, and you know, verified. And it's clear that right from the get-go, um, Mugabe was intent on creating a, a one-party state and, and entrenching his power. Of course, the record now shows during the uh, 37 years that Mugabe was in power that he um, did everything in his power to, to create that de facto one-party state and to sustain it. And he used all sorts of means against Zapu. And then from 1999 onwards against Morgan Sangarai and, and the, the uh, MDC opposition party. Uh, tied into that, of course, was the high levels of corruption that Mugabe allowed in, in the country uh, and you know, complete uh, abuse of power and um, patronage, which meant that a lot of the best qualified people to run the country were excluded, and in fact, many went into exile. And so Mugabe's legacy after 37 years in power is, is a very poor one. Um, mm. He basically transformed a country which had the second strongest economy in Southern Africa and one of the strongest economies in in the whole of Africa into a basket case. And, uh, and you contrast that with neighboring Botswana, for example, that uh, for a large extent upheld, upheld the rule of law. And, you know, it's, it's for all practical purposes, the same people, you know, comparable people. And, and, and you, it, it shows to you what ideolo ideology can do to a country um, and, and how destructive it was. But, you know, but back in the 80s, um, there were times when Mugabe was hailed around the world as the um, the chief reconciliator. Um, he got a knighthood, I believe, from the Queen of England or some some version of it. I'm not sure of the details. And some universities in the Western world gave him honorary degrees. And um, why is it that the Western world was so naive um, to not to to not see the atrocities committed against the Nderberi population? 
you've got to locate this discussion into the era in which that that happened and of course the cold war was still uh, raging in 1980 the, the battle between the soviet union on the, on the one hand and and the west and to a lesser extent um the communist party in china and and, and the west mm -hmm. the major battle of course was the cold war between soviet the soviet union and uh, the west and um that played out in zimbabwe uh, during the rhodesian war there were three uh, armies that fought that war there it was the rhodesian army there was mugabe's zanla army backed by the chinese and there was joshua nkomo's zipra army which was backed by the soviet union and so the, the first reason why mugabe was favored was because um he was not aligned to the russians he was aligned to the chinese which then constituted less of a threat to to the west uh, the west was very uh, worried about russian hegemony uh, in southern africa um you know with the the sea routes around the cape and access to uranium and a whole lot of strategic issues that played out and uh, because of that um as i say mugabe was not a threat secondly um uh, there was the, the issue of apartheid uh, uh, yeah. the, the um the west wanted apartheid to end and they recognized that a key component of bringing apartheid to an end was to convince white south africans that there could be life after majority rule and so M mugabe in a very cunning way played to that fear uh, and he he made these um placatory remarks um he focused on reconciliation with the white community and um not only the white community in uh, zimbabwe responded to that but the west responded to that and and embraced that and i think you know mugabe did it in a very cynical way he, he was a, a very cunning uh, politician but i think because of those two two reasons because of the west fear of the soviet union they were prepared to turn a blind eye to what mugabe was doing to uh, joshua nkomo and and zipra and and secondly as i say they were very happy with mugabe's remarks because they could then say to south africans look you feared robert mugabe uh, but clearly whites are now able to to remain in zimbabwe and farm and carry on pretty much as they had done before and therefore south africans white south africans have uh, you know little to fear uh, ending apartheid and embracing the anc um and and so for that reason you know, those two reasons we we saw the the west literally turn a blind eye to crimes against humanity um and uh, not only did they turn a blind eye you know mugabe became a darling as you correctly mm -hmm. said he was given a knighthood by queen elizabeth he got uh, several honorary uh, degrees awarded to him by leading uh, western universities including for example the university of Ed of edinburgh um and i can remember as a human rights lawyer during that that period having a major battle explaining to even some diplomats uh why uh what was going on in in the southwest of the country where i live nadibilland was a crime against humanity and potentially a genocide um and as i said it it was a battle because the the, the west was predisposed to supporting mugabe and it continued after the 1980s you know the, the, the west has been over backwards even in the 1990s and to a certain extent in the last 20 years that that you know the west has been relatively um sympathetic towards zanu pf and and robert mugabe yeah so sympathetic and i think in recent times they don't care really what's happening there you know it's rather um indifferent i would say to to, to zimbabwe which is even worse you know to just let things go on the way it is um you know okay that was now the 1980s and then um you know, 1990s, of course, when you take into account the Cold War comes to an end in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and Gorbachev's uh, launch of uh, Perestroika. 
And then, uh, obviously, apartheid comes to an end in uh, 1994. 1992, Dirk Clark releases Mandela from, from, from jail. And then 1994, Mandela becomes president. Um, you know, and, and I, growing up in the 1990s in South Africa, I still had the impression, although it, I now understand it's a false impression because we didn't take into account what happened in the bellies, but we still had the impression that the whites, at least in the 90s, were relatively well off in Zimbabwe. Is that correct or was it also false? I think it is correct. Um, let me stress that uh, whites outside of the rural areas of Matabeleland in the southwest of the country uh, had a very good life under Mugabe in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, white farmers in those areas outside of the southwest of the country uh, saw their that their, their farms flourish and they made a lot of money. Um, and I can recall in the, in the 1990s when I was warning the white business sector, I wrote articles about it, uh, warning them that um, my, my main call was that there could not be true and long-term sustainable economic liberalization without political liberalization. Uh, mm. And I was, uh, poo pooed by many uh, in the white community because their their businesses were flourishing and and that continued to be the case um, as I say until the early two thousands and it it was only in the early two thousands uh, that Mugabe turned against the white community and in particular against white farmers because um, white farmers. Uh, were in control of a, a critical political constituency that was the sort of swing vote. Um, just to digress a moment, ZANU PF mm -hmm. has always controlled uh, Zimbabwe's version of the homelands, communal areas where there's no title, uh, people um, own their, well, had access to land under um, you know traditional laws, but mm -hmm. had no title themselves. And they traditionally supported ZANU PF. That was a major block of voters. A second block of voters were urban black people uh, who in 1990, the late 1990s, turned uh, uniformly uh, against Mugabe. And then there was this third block of, of voters constituting about 500,000 voters who were uh, commercial farm laborers. And they literally were the swing vote. And Mugabe recognized this and recognized that um, because they, they, the, the, the farm bosses, the farm owners were going to vote for the opposition, there was a major uh, likelihood that this block of some 500,000 black commercial farm workers would also vote for the opposition. And for that reason, more than trying to redress historical injustices in the allocation of land, uh, caused Mugabe to turn against white farmers um, uh, to, to disrupt this uh, political um, arrangement that farmers had with their, their labor. And of course, um, it had a ripple effect because uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe's economy has been primarily agriculturally based uh, by destroying white commercial farmers, Mugabe then destroyed whole swathes of other sectors of the economy. And, um, and because of that, many uh, white businessmen were then uh, impoverished and, and saw their businesses collapse because with commercial farming collapsing, uh, their, their own businesses collapsed as a result. And what was the driving ideology behind uh, Mugabe at the time? Because one would think, you know, as a, anyone of a bit of an economics background, that as soon as you go for land, you destroy the economy. And yet, as the farms started collapsing, and as the, uh, um, you know, the refugees came to South Africa, I, mean, I remember clearly in South Africa at the time, they weren't called refugees at the time, called foreigners, but they were refugees. Um, you know, you could see this catastrophe in the making, and yet he persisted with ideological fervor, you know, um, which is quite incredible, really. Well, it was really 
you see, where I differ, differ with you, Hugo, is I don't believe it was ideological fervor. I think that Mugabe and Zanu PF had ideological fervor perhaps in the early 1980s, but by the 90, 1990s, um, they had lost a lot of their, their socialist and communist ideals. Uh, and by the late 1990s, they had become thoroughly corrupt. You may recall that Mugabe went into the DRC. He sent yeah. uh, Zimbabwean troops into the DRC in 1997. And that was largely motivated by the riches uh, in the DRC rather than any notions of regional solidarity. And the, the military went in. There's, there's a very detailed United Nations report that was produced in 2001. And it really was the gen genesis of state capture in the country and the entrenchment of systematic corruption. Uh, and, and so from that time on, uh, ideology wasn't really the, the driving force behind Mugabe. It was, it was the retention of power using any means because there was an understanding that um, power had to be retained because if power was lost, uh, not only might they face uh, prosecution internationally for crimes against humanity committed in Zimbabwe and economic crimes committed in the DRC, uh, but, but also uh, they, they would um, you know, face prosecution for, for corruption in the country. Uh, and, and abuse of office. And so uh, any notions of ideology were, were, were replaced by pure greed. Uh, and that has been the driving force of um, ZANU-PF uh, ever since then. Uh, it, it is the retention of power. And, and really nothing has changed since Mugabe went, in fact, if anything, since Mnangagwa came into power a few years ago in 2017. The level of corruption has grown, and the intensity of repression has has grown, and it's got nothing to do with ideology. It's solely to do with and, and the, Gaga, with to the be clear, retention was, of absolute uh, power. So, so Manangaga, to be clear, was Mugabe's right-hand man, as I understand it. And he was also responsible for the genocide in um, Matsabeli land. He was responsible for great deal of the loot of the DRC, and yet he retains power. And I remember a few years ago when he got into power, um, Mugabe ousted by a supposed coup d'etat, you know, you can perhaps go on to the details of that. Um, yet the West reacts again and, and say, there's euphoria and change coming to Zimbabwe. You know, why do we keep on getting this wrong? I, I think, um... Well, let, let me just first of all comment about Menangagwa. Yes, Menangagwa um, has always been Mugabe's enforcer. He's not the only one, but he was a critical one back in 1983 when Mugabe turned against Joshua Nkomo, uh, and he's been a critical player in the suppression and oppression of the MDC since it was formed in 1999. Um, and but turning to the nub of your question, why does the West? Why did the West embrace Mnangagwa? Uh, I think it's down to a number of things. You know, first of all, uh, many Western countries have a very superficial view of of Zimbabwe. We are no longer a strategic interest for the West. Uh, we don't have you know oil. We don't have ISIS terrorists. We don't command a strategic sea route. Uh, and to, to that extent, uh, we, we, we're simply not a, a concern that merits detailed attention. If, if anything, uh, we are, are a headache. Uh, you know, yeah. the West is, is now weary of the Zimbabwean crisis. It's gone on for over two decades, and they just want it to end. And so when Minangagwa... Uh, a bit like Mugabe in 1980, he started to say the right things about uh, embracing constitutionalism and tackling corruption. Uh, there were many um, people, particularly in Britain at the time, but also in, in Europe and, and the United States, who, who were very happy to take that at face value. Uh, and many of us warned, uh, I was never enthusiastic about Mugabe's overthrow, as much as I 
disliked the way that Mugabe ruled. I understood that that Mnangagwa, if anything, was worse than Mugabe. Uh, and so, you know, the day after thousands of people came out, out in the streets in yeah. Harare and Bulawayo in November 2017, celebrating the, the military's removal of, of Mugabe, I, I wrote an op-ed saying that, you know, our, our optimism was misplaced. And I, I, I'm very yeah. sad that I've been proved right. I wasn't you know, the I only one who warned at the time. conversation with... But it's um, taken Chris, time in the eyes of the witness. I, I had this conversation with Chris Greenland, who was the, um, I believe, the first black judge in uh, Rhodesia at the time. And I had with him in private in Pretoria, and he told me the exact same thing on the day when Gago was um, inaugurated. He said to me, look, trouble is coming. This is not going to be a, a euphoria, and we should be very wary of what's happening. And, uh, you know, it's the same conclusion you came to um, from, you know, two different points of view, I suppose. Um, no, I guess I want to get to to modern Zimbabwe. You know, we've taken out the route from Rhodesia, also a tragedy in its own making. Um, you find Zimbabwe, the eighties, the Bailey's get killed. Nobody cares about them. Uh, then the whites get killed, and you know, they you were the only one of the few people who spoke out in the beginning. Um, what what is modern Zimbabwe like now? Now post Mugabe, how is that unfolding? Well, I'm afraid that it's worse than um, uh, rule under under Mugabe for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the the economy has continued to flounder uh, since Mugabe went. We've seen the resurgence of uh, hyperinflation. Uh, you know, one of the things that Mnangagwa did that Mugabe didn't even do was to uh, Reintroduce um, this um, a new Zimbabwean currency, and and he he brought in this rule that our currency was uh, worth one to one against the U.S. dollar. It it was a fiction in the beginning. We all warned that it was a fiction, uh, and of course it has once again eroded people's savings and their their pensions. Um, which Mugabe did in the, the late 2000s. We had that first round of hyperinflation. We now have had a second round of hyperinflation, but of course it comes on the back of the first round. And, yeah. and so people were, were weak and, and, and are weaker now. Uh, so that's the first thing. The, the economy is, is floundering. There have been very poor economic policies implemented. Secondly, as I mentioned just now, we've seen a resurgence of, of corruption. A funny thing about Mugabe, just to go back to him, you know, Mugabe was never a businessman. Uh, to mm. that extent, he, he personally was more of an ideologue. Uh, his wife was a business uh, woman, uh, but Mugabe himself was never, never really interested in business. And he himself was not particularly corrupt. His wife was corrupt. Um, but, you know, Mugabe, um, Really, was you never had his name attached to to deals and and the like. Whereas the, the people running the regime now have always been deeply involved in business uh, and deeply connected to um, the, the abuse of power and 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 corruption. And so we've seen corruption reach entirely new levels. Uh, the South African newspaper Daily Maverick recently produced a report in January this year regarding uh, cartel operations in Zimbabwe. And if you read that report, you'll see that it, it all points back to senior people within ZANU-PF um, who control um, many of these cartels and benefit from these cartels. And so we've seen the accumulation of wealth on a scale uh, never seen before in, in, in this country. And then finally, um, the human rights situation is dramatically worse than under Mugabe. Uh, Mugabe never deployed troops into the streets of Harare to gun down civilians in broad daylight. Mugabe never cut off the internet. Uh, Mugabe um, systematically tried to uh, destroy Zapu in the 1980s, but he never went to the lengths that 
Minangagwa has gone to, in the last year, in particularly to utterly destroy the, the opposition. We've seen this multifaceted program uh, since the onset of COVID with the ZANU-PF government using the cover of COVID to utterly destroy the, the only uh, viable opposition by removing opposition MPs from parliament illegally, by cutting off um, the government source of funding that, that, that the MDC Alliance was entitled to, by using the military to take over the MDC Alliance's headquarters, um, and by using laws as a weapon, not as an instrument of justice, targeting um, MDC leaders, youth leaders and the like. Something happened just today where an, an MDC Alliance a youth leader has been sentenced to 14 months imprisonment for utterly spurious charges. And although, mm. you know, Mugabe used law uh, as a weapon, weaponized the justice system, uh, it was never done on the scale that we've seen since 2017. So by every possible indicator, uh, Zimbabwe is in a far worse uh, state now than it, it was under Mugabe. Wow. And do you, I mean, it's, you know, you, you say that Mugabe is better than something already says a lot, you know, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite a statement. Uh, um, you know, on the human rights abuses, um, you know, there, there's a lot of speculation about human rights abuses in Zimbabwe, about the diamond mines, the gold mines, the businesses. Um, there's also uh, speculation that the true power never lied with Mugabe, but with his uh, generals. You know, to what, to what extent did Mugabe have control over his own regime? And, you know, now that he's gone, it, it would seem to me that whatever power he kept in check, you know, when I'm speaking of dictators against dictators here, has unleashed itself onto the people of, of Zimbabwe. Over the last 40 years, there's obviously been, uh, in fact, let me take it back further than that, 50 years, there's been, uh, an evolution of this relationship between the military and uh, ZANU PF and, and the politicians, the, the black nationalist politicians. Clearly, in the 1970s, towards the end of the 1970s, the, the military, the guerrillas under Zanla, um, had enormous power, and Mugabe came to power on the back of the military. Uh, and, and to that extent, was beholden to, to the military in the early years. But Mugabe consolidated his power. Um, in 1987, he amended the constitution of Zimbabwe and he really uh, consolidated an entrenched power in the uh, office of the president. And uh, his heyday was th that following decade. In the, in the late 1980s, 1990s, the, the power of the military uh, was, was diminished somewhat. And, and Mugabe really held sway. Um, he decided who would be promoted in the military, and uh, that he he was the, the the real center of power. But towards the end of the 1990s, um, with the revelations of corruption and with Mugabe in essence falling out with war veterans, um, uh, his power base was was diminished. Uh, he then allowed the military to go into the DRC, and that meant that key uh, leaders in the military became hugely enriched uh, through that process. And of course, it strengthened their, their hand. And with the emergence of Morgan Sangarai and the MDC in the 2000s, um, Mugabe's power was systematically undermined to the extent that in the 2008 election, he, he lost the election to Morgan Sangarai. Um, and it was only through the intervention of the military who turned against the MDC. Uh, and, and, you know, committed very serious crimes against humanity, against MDC leaders, and, and basically restored Mugabe's grip on power. But from that moment on, um, Mugabe really was just a fig leaf. The real power lay with, with the military. Uh, and that, that applied even during the, the government of national unity that I was part of. Uh, I was Minister of Education from 2009 to 2013, uh, where you had this government of national unity involving the MDC and ZANU-PF. But the true power, even during that government of 
uh, national unity lay with the military. And Mugabe needed the military to secure his election win in 2013. Um, and uh, his problem was that, I think probably because of age, that he he didn't understand the power dynamic within Zimbabwe. And so in 2017, um, egged on by his wife, uh, he, he turned against key elements in the military. And of course, they just decided, right, we need to put an end to this. Uh, and so Minangagwa, with key uh, military leaders, turned against Mugabe and showed uh, emphatically where the real power lay and where senior leaders' loyalties lay. They didn't lie with the, uh, you know, the, the constitutional president. They lay with the political leaders who who were prepared to, um, uh, to to be subservient to the military, and and of course, Mnangagwa is in exactly the same position. Mnangagwa would never ever uh, have come to power in 2017. Would never have won. I, I say won in inverted commas the the election in 2018 because our view is that he lost that election, but he he would never have been able to. Uh, retain power without the support of the military. And so, in essence, Zimbabwe is now just a military junta with a very, very thin veneer of civilian rule. It's sad that you say that, and it, it resonates with me. My uh, wife is from Iran. You know, it's the same story, essentially. You've got a military with a priest as a figurehead there. In Zimbabwe, it's, it's a little bit different, but it's it's the same story. And I guess the, the question would be is... And, and Mia Lama is the same. Uh, um, uh, the, the civilian politicians thought that they could uh, win elections, but the moment they they turned against the military, as we've seen in Myanmar, that, that the military just again reasserted their their authority. So the, the, the prospects, prospects of constitutionalism in Zimbabwe at this stage is very little. Um, prospects of fair elections, as you say, uh, Mugabe lost the 2008 elections. And, um, you know, we just said, uh, I remember him saying on TV, well, we're going to recount, or I don't accept the results, or something like this, basically rigging the election. Uh, we see Manangaga doing the same thing. So when all means of legitimate democratic protest has ended, uh, you know, as, as, as shown to be futile as in Zimbabwe, what is the, the recourse for the people of Zimbabwe? You know, how, or, or, or what does we in the outside will do to try and bring stability there? You know, I, I don't like using military force, for example, because we see how that worked out with Saddam Hussein. But yet we see the suffering in Zimbabwe and we would like to, to try and bring some kind of stability there. But what, what, what would you propose? So just to digress for a moment in answering this question, I'm just in the midst of reading Brum Fisher's the, the, the biography of Brum Fisher. And of course, the the ANC and Dom Contro and Om Contro were seized in 1962, 1963 had to confront very similar issues where they were face facing uh, a, a violent regime that was prepared to use any means to to hold on to power and to resist the uh, democratic rights of the majority of the population. And ironically, we're in exactly the same position uh, mm -hmm. today uh, as the MDC, as the ANC was in 1963. And inevitably, uh, there are young people in particular who say we've used parliament and that has failed. We've tried to use the courts. The courts are, uh, are, ha have been captured and that nonviolence has failed. Uh, and there are, you know, strident voices um, calling for some form of violent response. My own response to to that it, it is that, uh, as limited as our options are, we need to look at Iraq and, you know, look at the Arab Spring, uh, look at Egypt, and 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 look at our own country and and ask ourselves the question. What has violence achieved? Uh, and the danger is that if we take this this option, that we're simply going to perpetuate violence. 
So my own view, and it's it's tough. I'm now I turned 64 this year. I've been through one war. I have no desire to go through mm-hmm. another war. Um, I see the absolute fu- futility of of um, of violence. Uh, but we have a hard job to persuade. I my generation uh, of leadership has a hard job of of persuading young people that, that that they need to be patient and we need to be innovative in using uh, non-violent uh, methods of opposition. And I come back to this case today. Uh, you know, this young activist um, has been sentenced to 14 months imprisonment, uh, literally for for speaking out against corruption. Uh, you know, what, what it's what an is absolute outrage, and unfortunately, it fuels. Um, his his name is uh, 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 Comborera, um, and he um, uh, he he is a, a leader, one of the one of the youth leaders in um, in the in the MDC, um, and as I say, he he has been sentenced to to fourteen months in, in imprisonment. Um, and uh, young people are outraged. They're absolutely outraged because they, they can see that he is someone who's been commit, committed to nonviolence. And they say, well, you know, what has that achieved? Uh, and and it's, it, it is very difficult to, to argue against that. Uh, yeah. What I try to say to people, to young people in particular, is that time is on our side because of the demographics of, of the country. The average age of people in the country is 18. And we've seen that demonstrated even recently. You know, um, the most votes that Morgan Sangarai got in, in a very, you know, twisted electoral environment uh, was 1.4 million votes. Nelson Chamisa in 2018 uh, got 2.2 million votes. And we know that he got more than that, but even by the government uh, uh, method of counting, he got he almost doubled uh, Morgan Sangarai's votes, and and that was primarily because he was able to tap into to young people. And as this massive bubble of young people moves through the system, uh, it becomes more and more difficult uh, for Zanu PF to to rig elections, and so. What we've got to try and do is to persuade uh, this younger generation to mobilize using nonviolent means to register to vote and to use their energy to to mobilize other people to get out and vote to make it virtually impossible for um, this this regime to um, to, to rig the election. But as I say, it, it's an ongoing battle because. Um, it's increasingly difficult to persuade young people that they must um, resist the temptation to engage in violence. Now, one, one can understand anger from young people, but I, I agree with you there. Um, you know, coming back to Iran, as the example I know very well, the young people were violent last year. Government cut off the internet and they killed them on the streets, you know. And it's uh, it, it's it's there. There is something of a weapon of nonviolence, as illogical as it might sound to some people, where you do disarm the guy who, who oppresses you as well. Um, you know, David, you yourself have been in Zimbabwe for most of your life. Um, how did you survive that, and and what made you? decide to stay in Zimbabwe after all the whites have fled and, and, and actually after all so many Zimbabweans have fled, you know? So um, I uh, had every opportunity to leave the country uh, in the early 1980s. Both my parents and my wife's parents had left Zimbabwe and went to South Africa. Um, in my five years studying law in South Africa, I could see where South Africa was headed, and I had no desire to um, get engaged in in another, you know, futile war in in yeah. South Africa to defend white minority rule. Uh, and and so, uh, at, 
I, I, I embraced Mugabe's um, reaching out to us uh, when, when he encouraged whites to, to come back. Um, my wife and I also have a deep faith and, and we believe uh, that, that we were led back to, to Zimbabwe. And certainly the good Lord has, has uh, protected us in, in the last 38 years since being back in, in Zimbabwe. Um, but it, it, it's developed from, from there. Uh, I still have a great belief in this nation. Uh, I spoke right at the beginning of this interview about the, the, the enormous potential that Zimbabwe has. Um, you know, it, it should be the richest country in, in Africa. It's got every possible ingredient. It's got, uh, you know, beautiful tourist facilities, uh, amazing agricultural lands, good rainfall, uh, a remarkable array of, of mineral resources. It has one of the highest literacy rates yeah. in, in, in Africa, certainly. Uh, and the people are incredibly friendly. Um, you know, as a, as a white Zimbabwean, uh, I feel completely at home. I think that there's far less racial tension in Zimbabwe for all our problems than there is in South Africa. Indeed, I think that there's less racial tension in this country than there is in many countries. Uh, and I've always argued that the, the one missing ingredient uh, is democracy. And I think that when we can get rid of this generation that fought the war and is still fighting the war of 40 years ago, the younger generation do not have uh, the, the same outlook as that generation. They're not affected by the poison that that war injected into our society. So when I look at someone like Mako, this young man, um, that's his first name. That's that's what people commonly refer to him. His full name is Makombo Rero, uh, but uh, his short name is Mako. And when I look at the values that he holds to, I, I get a lot of encouragement. When I look at um, the you know the views of someone like Nelson Chamisa as an as an older white person, I can see that this coming generation uh, has a new vision for this country, uh, which I think. Uh, is going to be realized when they come to power. It, it's a question of getting them to power. Uh, incidentally, uh, my wife and I have four children. All of our children are back, are, are in the country, and they share that vision. And I look at their friendships, um, you know, for example, in racial terms, they are completely integrated into Zimbabwean society in a, in a way that I wasn't. When I went to school, I went to a predominantly white school. I had very few, if any, uh, real friendships with black Zimbabweans. In, in direct contrast, they have wonderful friendships. And I, I do see uh, a, a new Zimbabwe. Uh, and I think that when these younger people get into, into power, uh, they are then going to be able to turn this country around and uh, help it to achieve its its potential. So that's why I'm still here. If I look at the Zimbabwean diaspora, I mean, it's a remarkably educated crowd of people. Uh, my father is a head is a business manager at one of the schools in Polokwane. Many of his staff are Zimbabwean. Okay, most of the black teachers in South Africa are Zimbabwean, and I'm speaking of mathematics and science teachers. Um, I've worked in, in international projects, and there's always Zimbabwean in one of them, and they're educated, you know. And I, I always make the case that if the rule of the game, the law, rule of law, democracy, all the basics of a country is there in Zimbabwe, if, if those brains are a reflection of what's happening in Zimbabwe, or if they go back, the country will recover in no time. And I, I, I think that's, you know, it speaks to your point. It, it's, it's a question of time. Um, on the international front, I mean, so South Africa has the levers of diplomacy, right? So Zimbabwe depends on us diplomatically. Um, you know, what, what should we ask of our leadership in terms of Zimbabwe? It, 
in in most um, diplomatic issues, you you have to ultimately focus on self interest. That's what unfortunately uh, governs the world, um, and it's very hard to make any argument if you just look at Zimbabwe in isolation. The only way that you can persuade the West and the only way I believe that you can persuade, for example, South African political leaders to do the right thing is to show them that there, there, there should be self-interest involved. And that's particularly so with South Africa. Uh, Zimbabwe has been a corrosive influence in Southern Africa for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the collapse of the Zimbabwean economy and the flooding out of of refugees to South Africa has been one of the greatest threats to Nelson Mandela's vision in South Africa. Um, and while South Africa undoubtedly has benefited in ways that you've just spoken about by getting some of our best brains, some of our teachers, you know, work in South African schools and work in South African restaurants, overall, it has uh, undermined uh, the capacity of the South African government to achieve its social and economic goals. Uh, and the danger is that if Zimbabwe implodes again and there is a further massive exodus of Zimbabweans to South Africa, um, this time around that exodus will be constituted by people who do not have the same skills as those who went out in the first exodus in the, in, in the, the early 2000s. And that's going to put a further strain on South Africa. You just look in South Africa at the rise of xenophobia um, and the inability of the South African government to uh, deliver on some of its key basic uh, promises on housing and, and energy and jobs to, to black South Africans. That's going to put that under further strain. Uh, and what the South African government needs to understand is that Zimbabwe is going to implode if the democratic will of the, the Zimbabwean people is not respected. Um, fortunately, I think that Cyril Ramaphosa understands that. Um, in my private discussions with senior ANC people, even in the last year, it, that, that is clear to me. And so the problem now is not so much persuading Cyril Ramaphosa and the, the ANC that they need to deal with this. The problem is is more to do with the, the following things. Firstly, we have these major battles going on within the ANC, and those battles need to be ended because there are elements in the ANC who quite frankly admire uh, Manangagwa, uh, admire uh, ZANU-PF leaders who have captured whole swathes of the, of the state and are very corrupt and very rich as a result of it. And that battle within the ANC um, has to be won. Um, and so we, you know, we're watching very closely to see what happens to the Secretary General in the next 30 days in, in South Africa to see whether Cyril Ramaphosa and what I term the more democratic uh, wing of the ANC manages to consolidate its power. That's critical. Assuming that they do, you still got the second issue, and, and that is what to do about Zimbabwe. Uh, it's not that easy when you're dealing with a regime that doesn't care about the rule of law, doesn't really care about what other people think, and has enormous uh, wealth at, and power at, at its disposal, it becomes relatively immune to, to pressure from anywhere. Um, and so th this is an ongoing debate what the South Africans can do. But uh, there's no doubt that uh, the South Africans can play a massive role uh, when it comes to the next elections, because even Manangagwa, even Zanu PF, need the endorsement of uh, SADC and South Africa in particular uh, when it comes to the to saying that they are legitimate and that the elections were conducted freely and fairly. That that endorsement was not given by President Mbeki. Uh, it was not given by the AU and SADC in 2008, and it was that. Uh, um, because of that attitude that Mugabe was forced to enter into a government of national unity with Morgan Tsangarayan and the MDC. Uh, let me say this, that the MDC is not well disposed at all to another government of national unity. 
Uh, so that's not what I'm advocating for. But uh, what we are advocating for is that South Africa, come the next elections, insists that Zimbabwe's laws and our constitution be complied with, and that you know basic minimum standards uh, that, that have been applied in virtually all SADC countries that are, are applied to to Zimbabwe. Uh, if that happens, we are pretty confident that despite this uneven playing field, we can win and actually win comf comfortably because of that demograph demographic bubble of young people coming through the system. Um, I've got a question here from one of my listeners, and it's related to South Africa's uh, process on expropriation without compensation. It is now in front of our parliament. Um, you know, the parliament is proposing two things at the same time. One is to amend the constitution, which in my view would be a disastrous. Uh, the second one equally is just to implement a bill to do it, quote unquote, democratically. Um, you know, I understand in terms of land reform in South Africa that there are comparable questions to what Zimbabwe had. And it is not an easy task, you know, but there are ways to do it and there are ways not to do it. And, and you know, what should our response be? And, and are we also at risk of, of going the Zimbabwean route? In answering that, I think that there are two very distinct notions that one needs to consider. The, the first is the historical injustice, and that applied in Zimbabwe, uh, and it applies in South Africa. Because of history, there, there is uh, an uneven uh, allocation of, of land. And it was a time bomb in Zimbabwe. It's a time bomb in South Africa. Uh, but the second notion, the second issue that one needs to consider is the, the ideological question of uh, if you are going to redistribute land, how are you going to do it? And crucially, are you going to genuinely empower people by giving them title or are you going to disempower them by extending the notion of communal ownership? Uh, and so in Zimbabwe, um, there were very few people who argued against the inequalities of land um, holdings in the country. Even white farmers acknowledged that there needed to be some form of redistribution, um, uh, but it needed to be in a way that the, the skills of those white farmers, the business acumen of those farmers, the experience of those farmers was not lost to the nation. Uh, and at the same time that any new crop of black farmers who came in uh, could benefit from that experience and also uh, would, would get titled. Now, that, that didn't happen in Zimbabwe. Um, for ideological reasons, ZANU-PF has never wanted to give title to people because the moment you give title to people, whether they're white or black, you empower people. Mm -hmm. uh, they own the land themselves. And if they are hardworking uh, and industrious and and show you know considerable business acumen uh, they can expand their wealth and therefore their power in in society and that doesn't suit uh demagogues that doesn't suit uh, socialists and corrupt people who want to keep a grip and so applying those two uh, uh notions to the south african uh, situation what i've said and this is not the first time i've said I say to, to white South Africans, particularly white South African farmers, if you think that you can hold on to your present land holdings in a way that's unaltered, then you are not going to stop this time bomb from ticking. Uh, you need to reach an accommodation. The, uh, I, I'm not a socialist. I'm, I'm, I'm conservative in my outlook. But uh, th there needs to be a process whereby white South African farmers consider the land holdings that they've got. And there are some who can't yield land because they, they are on, on small blocks of land. But there, there are also other farmers who do have large blocks of land or multiple uh, farm holdings. Uh, it's very difficult to, to legislate for this. It, it has to be a desire. But I say to white farmers in South Africa, for goodness sake, be proactive and and uh, work out what land can be yielded. Tied into that 
it, there needs to be a change in attitude. Uh, well, you need to problem. build support yeah. within your own farm. Yeah, the problem in South Africa has been that the statistics that the government's using is dishonest. Um, there has been a transfer of land already, which they don't acknowledge, for example. But also the state owns a lot of land, and we still have communal land in some of the homelands areas. And exactly. So let me go to the second point. Mm. Let me just go on to the second point, because it addresses this issue that you're discussing now. In my view, what is critical is the issue of title. And we're not talking about title solely in former white-owned farms. We're looking at title in the former homeland areas, in the former Transkei, and vast tracts of land that the state in South Africa owns. Now, we know from a financial perspective, and, and particularly from an environmental perspective, that the best way to... Um, retain value of land both financially and in terms of the environment is by granting title to, to people uh, across the board. That never happened in Zimbabwe. Land was taken from, from whites and handed to black people who've never got title. And so they are always beholden to government. They, they have not been able to access bank loans and, and the like. But I, I hope you see it's this you know, yeah. two strands of, of thinking, uh, you know, on the, and in all of these things, there, there, there has to be compromise. Whites have to be amenable to the notion that there needs to be a, a discussion um, about their land holdings and, and how it will be done in future. But that the, the black majority government as well needs to respect the remaining title of white farmers and to grant title to black farmers and also to build an entire financial system and an, an agricultural education system around uh, the allocation of land to black farmers so that when black farmers come, come onto the land, they have the necessary financial backup to, to ensure that they can develop the land and they, they have the provision of um, uh, agronomy services and 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 the like. Uh, mm. Now, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a farmer, so take what I say with a pinch of salt. But I know that in the Zimbabwean context, that had that happened, had there been a meaningful discussion, the vast majority of white farmers would have been able to stay on their land in Zimbabwe with, yes, diminished land holdings but still on viable um, land units. And, you know, one other thing, let me say about Southern Africa, that we need to transform our thinking. Uh, when we look at our land holdings and we look at, for example, land holdings in Israel and see what the Israelis have done with minimal water and tiny uh, lots of agricultural land, you will see that with new technology, the new technology which is uh, available, one can make water and land go much, much further, be much more uh, productive and profitable than it has ever been before. And to that extent, in both Zimbabwe and South Africa, there's more than enough land for everyone. You don't have to displace a single white farmer if you use these, these modern technologies. But that is the key to, to going forward. We can't just allow this historical injustice to, to be perpetuated because ultimately the aspirations of, of young black farmers will not be met and, and this time bomb will, will expose, explode. But at the other end of the spectrum, we can simply never do what has happened in Zimbabwe and get rid of virtually all our white farmers with all their expertise, uh, with uh, all the experience, which has proved catastrophic uh, in, in the Zimbabwean uh, context, not just in the, in the narrow confines of the agricultural sector, but in terms of the overall economy. And the same thing will happen in South Africa. South Africa will find itself unable to feed itself in the way it's done. It will find itself unable to, um, to, to, to feed into all the secondary and, and tertiary industries that rely on the agricultural sector. 
So South Africa simply cannot afford to go down the same path as Zimbabwe. And, and, and consequently from that, I think Southern Africa cannot afford it because, you know, um, South Africa, given our regional status as a regional power, you can say, especially in terms of agriculture, we feed most of Southern Africa as well. So there's a, there's a, it's a very scary notion to think that you know, what happens to Bobby will happen. You'll have a humanitarian crisis on your hands. But, you know, just to continue on the farmers, most South African lacks today are going to cities. They're urbanizing. We, we have an urbanized culture. Um, we don't want to go back to the agrarian form of, of agriculture. It's all thinking. You know, we have 30,000 farmers in the country feeding, what was it, 50, 60 million people. Um, there's room for other farmers if they want to go on to it. But I, I get the impression from the ANC and from the EFF and, and all the, the, the radicals, it's not really about land. It's about something else. Um, you know, the land is being used as a weapon um, to rally support, to stick onto power, to deflect criticism, you know, all, all the things that happen in Zimbabwe as well. And, you know, to try and break through that spell of saying, look, the, the land reform is, is actually not that complicated in South Africa, probably less complicated than it would have been in Zimbabwe, given that you had a more of an agrarian culture at the time. There's no doubt that what she's... <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get, get some water. Talking too much. <clears throat> There's no doubt that what you say is largely correct. Um, if you look at the pattern, not just in Africa, but uh, throughout the world, um, there has been a process of urbanization. And the vast majority of young people want to be able to go to shopping malls and play football or watch football on a Sunday. They, they don't want to be stuck out in the rural areas. And, and so in, in America and Europe, we saw massive urbanization and we see that in south africa and it's true that um the the vast majority of of, of young people do not want to be farmers they, they have different aspirations and, and and that is particularly so in in zimbabwe when you go into communal areas in zimbabwe you see hardly any young people um they've got every opportunity to be there every right to be there the vast swathes of land, which is of you know prime land, which has been allocated to to black Zimbabweans, but you see very few young people doing that, uh, and so it's absolutely correct. And you've got unscrupulous politicians in Zimbabwe who used the the emotive land issue um, as as a foil, as a cover uh, to to hold on to power, and as I say, to prevent the MDC from from winning. An election. And of course, now they're in the situation where they have impoverished rural people and people can no longer feed themselves. Uh, they are dependent on food handouts. And they also know that if uh, villagers, for example, uh, vote against ZANU PF, uh, they will lose their, uh, their, their right to be on, on that land. Uh, and, and so it serves Zani PF's policies very well. And I, I can remember having th these debates in cabinet with Mugabe and, and others saying, for goodness sake, uh, this is no longer about race. I'm a white Zimbabwean. I'm saying give black Zimbabweans title. And of course, they, they simply, I go back to this argument I had just now. They will not give title because giving title gives people power to make up their own minds. And th there's a real danger in South Africa that um, unscru unscrupulous politicians will will do the same, and when they do it, of course, they they destroy they will destroy the South African economy as as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, but I still come back to to white farmers. Um, I'm not laying the blame on on white farmers in South Africa. All I'm saying is that white farmers mustn't just react; they need to anticipate this and be proactive, because there are um, obviously, black politicians of great integrity in the country who are not unscrupulous, who understand what I'm saying now, and yeah. one has to build alliances and and so that you're not just fighting this from 
the narrow perspective of a, a white farmer's um, clique, because those white farmers' cliques can always be um, said to just be protecting their own interests and be, be said not to have the you know the interests of South Africa at at heart. Uh, and no doubt, whilst there's always an element of of self interest, uh, I have no doubt that there's also national interest. That you know you, you've got many uh, white South African farmers who are are passionately nationalistic about South Africa and want South Africa to succeed, but they they must build alliances um, with key elements of black society. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, David, just on the last minutes that we, we have left, um, you recently wrote a book, um, which is called uh, The Struggle Continues 50 Years in Zimbabwe. Uh, can give us a brief synopsis of what it's about, and I believe people can find it on Amazon, right? Yeah, thanks, Hugo. I, I do a little promotional thing here. That that is the book there, uh, published by Jakana, uh, South African Publishing House. It is available on Amazon and through exclusive books and uh, CNA in South Africa. It was published a few years back now, almost five, well, five years ago. Um, it is a broad sweep of of um, Zimbabwean history. It starts in the 1950s and it goes to 2016. Uh, I describe it as a, a political autobiography. It is a, an autobiography, but it um, deals with these uh, broad sweeps, uh, uh, you know, of, of um, Zimbabwean history. Uh, so uh, one, one is always hesitant to, to sing the praises of of your own book, uh, but it has been uh, very generously reviewed by by many people. Um, and so uh, if people are interested in the subject of of Zimbabwe, and if you aren't Zimbabwean, if you, for example, South African, I urge you to read it because it gives many insights, not just into South Africa, in, into Zimbabwe, but I, I believe insights into South Africa and, and hopefully South Africans can learn from the mistakes that we've made. Yeah, I, I think that is the, the lesson for most of Africa, really, of any country that, that finds themselves in a difficult historical position, is that the Zimbabwean case, if anything we learn from it, is not to do and not to repeat the same mistakes. Um, David, I, I would like to, to thank you again for, for being here, for giving me your time. And uh, any time in the future, uh, human rights issues of the sort, I see you on Twitter. People need to follow you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hugo. Uh, Zimbabwe is a forgotten country in many respects, and so occasions like this are very important, uh, not just, as I say, for Zimbabwe, but also for the whole of Southern Africa. Um, my final word, my fervent belief is that if we turn Zimbabwe around, we'll turn the whole of Southern Africa around. And so it's in everyone's interests that um, this struggle to bring democracy to Zimbabwe is supported in whatever way people can support it. So thank you. Thank you.